Yeah, I think we can start. Okay. Uh, so welcome all. Um, I'm Brian Amara. I'm a professor here at University of Tennessee, Knoxville, in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. I'm one of the people who works on our graduate admissions committee. Um, Zingli, who are you? Yeah, I'm Zingli. I'm an associate professor here in the same department, EEB at UTK. And I've been on the graduate admissions committee here for, I think, the last six, seven years. So, you know, it's just a seminar that we'd like to share our experiences with you all. Yep. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I'm just excited you're all here. All right, so some caveats to start with. So our focus is on US-based schools. All right, we both have experience there. Our focus is on programs with a research-based master's and PhD, um, focus on ecology and evolution. Um, and also, and so, you know, if you're thinking of applying to a program in biochemistry, some information will apply, some won't, right? Um, if you think of applying to school in London, same thing. Um, also, our experiences might not be predictive of yours, right? People are often treated differently due to age, gender, ethnicity, marital status, and much more. Um, and so I might not experience things that you might experience at a place or in grad school. And so something to consider. Anything to add, Singley? No. Okay. All right, so one thing to consider um, when you're thinking about going to grad school is why. Right, so what sort of career you're thinking of afterwards. And it could just be like, you just love studying dolphins, you wanna spend the next five years studying dolphins. I don't, don't care about the, what you're gonna do after, and that's fine. But I'll be thinking about like what your job might be after. And so one possibility is working at non-governmental organizations, right? It's like Nature Conservancy or something like that, our World Wildlife Fund. Um, another possibility is working at a government agency. So like a national or state park, wildlife agency, regulatory agencies like the US EPA. Um, academia is a common desired outcome. Um, that can be like working as a lab man manager or a curator of a museum. It can also be a tenure stream faculty, so someone who works for a while and then hopefully gets a more guaranteed job, not perfectly guaranteed. Um, also non-tenure stream faculty where you work on annual or multi-year contracts. Um, industry, um, so you can work on research or data analysis or sustainability, right? So like, you know, Home Depot wants to become a greener company. They could hire someone like you to go help them like figure out how to be a greener company. Um, also transferable skills, right? So as you finish grad school, you, you will have helped organize multi-year projects. You'll not, you might know how to write software, do machine learning, data analytics, teaching, field work, lots of different skills. And so you could take those in different directions. Um, one colleague I had who did an amazing job at ecology decided to go off and work on um, online commerce. Right, and they're probably happy doing that. And so, you know, this isn't the most direct way to that, but there are routes that way. Um, another thing to consider, right, with all of this is survivorship bias, right? So all the faculty you meet were our successful faculty, right? So it's the XKCD cartoon on the right, right? And so, you know, we know it's worked for us, but what you don't see is those for whom it didn't work, right? Who like by luck didn't get the job or things like that. And so keep that in mind too, as you're thinking about programs and you're thinking about outcomes. There are a few different paths in grad school, right? Um, you have a coursework master's, a research master's and a PhD or a PhD. We're talking about mostly today, the last two. And so for the research-based ones, with PhD and research masters, it's basically writing papers, right? Or, and then become chapters in your dissertation or thesis. And so research masters need at least one chap paper worth of thing, PhD need at least three. The different amount of time required. So masters is two, maybe three years, PhD is five, maybe six. Um, all require a BA or BS for prereq. Um, some PhD programs want you to have a master's first, many don't. Um, and so whether you decide to start first, start with a master's start, or start with a PhD, it can depend on your background and like how much research you've done already, how confident you are in what you want to work on. Right? If you're still not quite sure what exactly what you want to do, a master's is a good way to sort of sample a field before you commit to it for half a decade. Um, and cost, we're going to get you in a little bit as well. So a coursework master is often the student pays, um, whereas for research and PhD, the institution often pays, often pays in terms, of, in terms of pay for doing research or for teaching. Anything to add to this? Um, 
No, not specifically. Although some places for coursework masters, you might still start by paying for the class, and then sometimes there might still be TA ships that could fund you for like some semesters. Uh, so I've, I've I've known for that to happen. But I think what like our seminar today is mostly talking about a research uh graduate program. So we're we're talking about the last two columns: the research masters and the research PhD. Yep. All right, so in EB programs, especially for like research and PhD, you typically get paid, right? So, you know, for undergrad, you're paying a lot. For med school, you pay, you'd pay a lot, vet school, law school, et cetera, right? Here, it's the reverse. You get paid to go. Now, the pay isn't for the school per se. It's often to be a teaching assistant or research assistant, right? So you're doing work for pay, but in return for that, they pay your tuition, they pay healthcare fees um, and things like that, and also a stipend. You work for typically nine months, um, and some schools pay you over nine months. You might just have to make sure you budget for the summer. Some schools pay provide that pay over 12 months. It often starts the month after you start working, right? So, you know, when you first go to a place for grad school, you might have to rent an apartment. So you might need first and last month rent. Uh, you might need a security deposit and you might need to be able to support yourself for a month before you start getting paid at all. Right? That's sort of an odd system and not ideal, but common. Um, when you're offered admission, your letter should include this information. It shouldn't be a surprise to you. So before you decide which school to go to, you should know that school A will pay me this much, school B will pay me this much, how they pay you, what's covered in it, and so forth. Um, tuition should be, in should be included. Um, also subsidized health care. Uh, fees may or may not be included, right? So at our program, we used to charge students a fee for I think, using the gym, right? And they would have to pay the gym fee, right? And that was now now the now that's included in pay for TAs, right? Some places might still have that. And so looking at what those fees are can be important too. Um, you can get an idea before you start. Um, there's a website called phdstipends.com. And so you can compare, you know, ecology programs, evolutionary programs, and see what people have said. And this is all crowdsourced. And so one thing to note about this is what the pay is can vary by the person, right? So it could be the base pay for all TAs. It could be the base pay plus a fellowship they're getting. It could be RA pay for an institution. It could be RA pay from NSF or from NIH. So it's not necessarily a prediction of what you might get, right? So this person might be getting 24,000, but that's a base pay of 18,000 plus a supplement of 6,000, right? Where someone else in that lab might get a you know $30,000 NSF fellowship. Um, and so, you know, don't take this as gospel. Wait until you see what your offer is, but sort of get you a sense of like what sort of ranges there are. Okay. Um, one thing that varies a lot is cost of living. And so, you know, a pay that, you know, in Mississippi looks low might actually be adequate to live on, whereas at Berkeley, it might not be not, not nearly enough, right? You know, you get, you know, more money than that. And so this living wage calculator is a website um, you can go to and you can then see, you know, basically what, what you can do is take your living wage, multiply it by the number of hours, 20, 80 per year, and get what the overall like on the living wage would be for that for that location, right? So for Cambridge Mass, uh, if you want to go to MIT, right, living wage would be $62,000 a year, right? Whereas Ox Oxford, Mississippi would be much, much less. And so when you're comparing programs, you know, you can see what the stipends they offer you are and see, are you going to be able to survive well and live well on that stipend? All right. Um, anything to add to this? Um, no, not really. Okay. Um, also, you note that, like, the living wage changes a lot with children and spouses, right? Health, like, childcare is way very, very expensive. Um, and so that's something that's factored fact, in, into your decision. Some universities offer sponsor, like sponsored childcare, some don't. So if you have children, that's something to, to look at once you get an offer letter. So the way healthcare works in the US is kind of odd, right? So we divide the people into medical care, right? Which is all this stuff. And then vision, which is separate and dental, which is separate. And so most programs will probably give you medical care. They might give you vision and or dental if you pay more for it, right? So you can check out what those what's offered there. Oftentimes they'll offer different kinds of plans. Like you can get a Blue Cross Blue Shield plan or a different kind of plan. Um, they have different offices you can go to. 
So think about what you need. And again, this should be clear in your offer letter, or then you can look at you can ask the department for more information once you get this information. But you know, it's it's a system where those who aren't used to taking care of healthcare on their own, it's kind of weird at first um, how it's done. I'm not sure why it's that way, but worth knowing. Um, another big part of healthcare in grad school is mental health care. Um, so you think about what grad school typically entails, right? Often it's a new location, new people. Um, sometimes it's, it's stressed about getting graded, though oftentimes that drops off as you continue on. Grades become less important in grad school. It's more about the work you do. Um, there's certain high, high stress events, like it's your qualifying exam. Are you, are you ready to continue to pursue your PhD? Some students aren't and they fail. And so it's a very scary event. Um, research failure. Um, you know, a tornado can go through your research site, a fire can go through, right? You just like the thing you predicted would happen is not happening. And that's a still discovery, but it might not feel happy at the time. Um, rejection happens all the time. We just we got a paper published that I'm really proud of that went through like seven journals first. It's like, no, 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 no. But yes, right? But you hear all those no's first. And even the yeses come with, yes, but fix this thing. Um, so that, that's another insult to your health. Um, and then low stipends, right? So you'll see what the stipends are. Um, you get your offer letter and they're often enough to live on, but they're not generous by any means, right? Because the lower the stipend, the more students that can be admitted. And so people want, want more students, want to train students, want students to work in the lab. And so there's this trade-off. And so oftentimes you're, you're, you're you know, have to deal with low income. Um, so studies show depression is common among grad students. We'll have to, the next slide will show, tell more about that. And so when they think about when you're admitted is how does mental health care work at your program, right? Is there good coverage? Um, is there group therapy, individual therapy, things like that? Um, here's some data. So incidence like depression overall in the US is 8.3%. Um, Berkeley grad students did a study of just STEM students. So science, technology, engineering, and math and found that it was between 42 and 48%, depending on field, right? Another paper study came out this month on depression in Sweden. Um, and you can see how, you know, through grad school, you get this peak of, you know, proportion of students receiving psychiatric medicine, right? So none of this means that if you have psych if you have you know, mental health challenges, issues you're getting treated for already, you should not go to grad school by any means, right? It just means that, you know, there's something that where it's a common side effect of grad school that's worth considering and thinking about how you can help yourself and also help your, you know, your cohort mates as you go through, um, and just be aware of this issue, right? Go ahead, Zingli. Yeah, so yeah, one, one piece of advice that we can give is also like, you know, when you are applying to different programs or starting to talk with prospective advisors, you know, feel free to ask for, for context of their grad students or, you know, people in the program that you can talk with regarding their experience with healthcare, their ex experience with mental health and support. So you get an idea of like what's in the program and, you know, um, how your potential lab mates, you know, deal with issues, if they've got any issues, things like that. So it, it's, it's always good to talk with different people rather than, you know, to get more information rather than be in an information vacuum. Yep. Um, and also, whenever, whenever you're getting information from people, make sure you keep them safe too. So if they say like, oh, my advisor is terrible, don't say to the advisor, hey, your students say you're terrible, right? Keep that information, but, you know, make sure people know it's safe to, to disclose things to you. Yeah. So mentorship. So for undergrads, there's a lot of focus on like, what's the top ranked school in blah, right? For grad school, that's less important than who your advisor was, right? It's a much more apprenticeship model. Right. Um, in some programs, you would get admitted to the program generally and then do rotations, right? You might try out a few labs. Some programs have sort of a direct admission where you have to have someone who says, yes, I want them in my lab to get in. Um, but in the end, it tends to be a very much an apprenticeship where like you have one or maybe two mentors who guide you, right? And, you know, they connect you to their professional contacts. They write your letters of rec for your first jobs. Um, they help guide your research. They help pick you up after you get a negative review, right? So who they are and how they mentor you is a very important thing. And so you're thinking about applying to grad school, you know, perhaps more important than like, should we go to A, place A or place B? It's should I work with person A or person B, right? And think about what those people are and what they're working on. 
right? And then after you identify them, then see if you also are happy with the department and the school and location. Right? Um, so how do you find them? So one thing to do is think about like what you want to work on and see who's doing cool work in the field, right? So Google Scholar is one way of looking up information. Open Alex is another, right? We can just say like, I want to do salamander phylo phylogeography, right? And you can then see who's doing papers in phylo salamander phylogeography. And then you can look and say, oh, is their work interesting? Um, one convention in our field typically is if it's in someone's lab, they're either first author or last author, right? Um, oftentimes last author. And so, you know, you know, you look at a paper and like it might be the you, the person is a grad student and the final person is the actual lab that it's, they're working in. Okay. And when you get that, then you can go look at their lab websites. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, and you also look at stuff like who's writing review articles, right? So who's like an expert in the field and so add things like that. You sort of dig into more like who's doing interesting work in, in my area. So here's an example I'm using with permission from um, Thais Vasconcelos, who's a professor at University of Michigan, right? And on her web, web page, you know, she has an overview of what she does, right? And what her lab does. Um, you can also see she has a thing where I'm looking for a PhD student, right? So oftentimes people who are look, actually, actually looking for students advertise it, right? Because in an era, you know, in a situation where, you know, grad students are funded from teaching assistantships or research assistantships, there's a finite amount of funding available, right? And so either there's, you know, a TA line the program has, or the professor got a grant from NSF to pay for a grad student, right? So, or, so professors have different availabilities of like, oh, my lab's too big now, I don't want more than five students. And so many faculty aren't looking for students all the time, right? Um, and so you have to figure out like, is, is the faculty member actually looking for students? So you first look at that, it's worth looking at who's in the lab and are they are they you know being successful, right? So you know the person's web page and see you know who's who's what they're doing. You can look at each of them, right? It can be useful to use the Internet Archive and go back in time and see who was in the lab two years ago and three years ago, and what happened to them, um, or the the lab alumni page, right? Um, and then you can also look through what the person's actually working on, right? Sometimes people are famous for doing something ten years ago and completely switched their research program. So like, wow, this person's really great at botany, but now they're working on animals and I want to work on botany still or something like that. And so you can see what they're doing at the moment by looking at their research. Um, one other thing about our field. So this is from Tisa's website. Professor students are advised to contact me to discuss potential projects before applying. And so whereas for undergraduates sort of apply and apply to all your schools, right? Here's worth reaching out to particular faculty you're interested in and talking through your projects. Right, and that's an issue area where they're often, you know, faculty get many, many emails. They might be slow replying, so you can try emailing them again a month later if they don't reply, or they might be in the field or something. Um, but yeah, definitely reach out to faculty about what you want to do and why them. And the more precise you can be, the better. Um, Zingli, you get lots of applications. What's what's your advice to letter writers for this first yeah. email? Yeah, so I think the main thing is to keep it relatively short and concise and you know first paragraph state where you're from what institution you're at now uh, what you're interested in you know then followed by another one or two sentences on what you have done you know what are some of the projects you have done as undergrad what are some of the skills that you have and make sure that it's relevant to the lab that you're applying to um, so a lot of the times when you know when 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 faculty members see who applies to them you know, they are looking at if the fit in terms of research experience or in terms of the skills, right? Like perhaps one, one professor might be looking for people who have like uh, extensive skills in fish sampling, you know? So if you know that's the case, you make sure you put in that relevant experience. I think that's the most important. So, yeah. yeah. And trying to be generic, right? Like, you know, you're a person I wanted to study biology, you're a biologist, won't work, right? Whereas I want to study like fish dynamics and populations due to climate change. That's a better, better approach. Okay. Um, so when evaluating an advisor, look at their most cited and most recent papers, right? Um, before you even do the open email to them. Get a sense of their priorities, right? So are they um you know, really, really into this research topic and not the other research topics they've been on, 
Um, do their priorities align with yours, right? Um, look at current and past students in their lab, right? See if they've been successful. And successful doesn't necessarily mean, you know, getting a particular kind of job, just successful in terms of like, are they happy where they ended up sort of thing? And do they want to go that way? Or do they force to go that way? Um, talk to current trusted people about the advisor. So we often talk about a whisper network. So in science, there's lots of power dynamics and there can be lots of misconduct. And so figuring out like, is this person actually a good person? Because it means like, you know, being very good at writing papers not correlate to with being a good mentor, right? And so not all whispers are true, right? But a lot of them are. And so trying to figure out that as best you can. Um, I'll talk about visit day and that gives you more information too later. But yeah, you have, to, you have to get a sense of like, is this a good person to spend the next half decade with as my mentor, right? Um, one use, useful thing is the academic sexual misconduct database made by Judy Labar uh, Julie Labarkin. Um, and that has public issues of, you know, for example, one advisor threw rocks at his students in Antarctica, right? And like, that's bad. Don't work with that. You know, that's problematic, right? Whereas, and this only has public records. And so there are many cases where that doesn't, doesn't get publicized in newspapers, so it's not in this database, but it can still be useful to see is your potential advisor in the database? If not, how does the institution handle harassment, right? Is there something where you can see, oh yes, this institution never talks about harassment at all. Maybe that's the thing to worry about. Um, another thing is their career stage, right? So tenure track, if they're coming up for tenure, that means either get, you know, an un unlimited contract or fired, right? So are they on the cusp of that? Um, are they near retirement? Um, are they moving into administration and won't have as much time to do research? Um, what do they expect of their students? What can they expect from them? This might be on their lab website. Um, Zingli, what else? Um, I think you've covered most of these things. I, I feel like the most important thing personally for me when I was uh, you know, looking for a graduate position when I was in your position is to really talk with people that worked with the advisor um, past students and current students and you know and most of the time or you know they would be able to tell you honestly what they think of the advisor and of course you 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 should make your own evaluations based on what you hear from the students as well as what you hear from the advisor because you know there, may, there are many sides to different issues and there might be issues that are con contentious you know things like that so you, you 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 have to evaluate from different angles from different sources of information and all that and also like you know i think most of you would be working have really worked with um different researchers or or, or professors in your own home institution feel free to ask them about what you know if they heard about you know the mentoring style or the research of the you know this 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 professor that you're interested to apply to and i think your current professor will be able to tell you a lot too like give you advice on um you know who 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 to look for um, who to talk to and things like that. So lean on those networks that you already have and talk to lots of people, basically. Yeah. And one thing interesting in our field is like the way labs work can be very different, right? So some labs are like machine. They have like the PI and like three postdocs and five grad students and 20 undergrads and they all like work on big papers together. And some labs are like one advisor and two grad students. And so you can see like what sort of lab you want and what works best for your needs as a student. Um, it's the thing you get from that's the thing we said, talk to other people in the field. Um, next thing is location. And so there's obvious things like Arizona is hot, Fairbanks is cold, right? And so that can matter a lot to, you know, because like it's not only a place you're gonna study, it's a place you're gonna live and maybe do field work. And so thinking about like if you really, really, really hate heat, that's worth knowing about when you're applying, right? Um and very different environments, right? So on the left is Arizona, on the right is Alaska, right? And if you like, if you just need trees to be whole, then you know it's worth considering that. Um, another thing that comes up is policies that vary across the U.S. And so here's a trivial example to start with. So like, can you keep a ferret? Right? Let's say you you have a ferret. You like you want to have your ferret on your desk in grad school. Can you do it? And so there's different levels at which that can be allowed or not allowed, right? So in the US as a whole, yes, you can have ferrets, right? In particular states, you can't. So California, no ferrets, right? Um, Massachusetts, yes, ferrets, 
Okay, so that already is the thing. So even though it's not a federal policy, it's a state policy. And it continues all the way down, right? So US, no regulation keeping ferrets. State law, New York, legal. California, illegal. Okay, let's say I'm going to New York. Albany, legal. New York City, illegal. And then if I'm looking at you know, the colleges in Albany, some might allow pets on campus, some might not allow pets on campus, right? And so there's no like US national law. It's, it's these topics, these vary by place and they can change, right? So New York could make ferrets legal again, right? Or the university could say, oh, we're changing our policy to allow pets because they're great for enjoyment or something, right? Or it could be, you know, the US puts a national ban on ferrets. We just hate those things, right? And so all those things can change, but they're all like, this nested set of policies, okay? And so ferrets are an easy example, um, but also examples that matter a lot to people, right? And not these don't matter to everyone, so people have different needs and different priorities, right? But like gun policy, right? Um, drug policy, abortion access, gender affirming care, um, rights to limits on protest, how controversial topics can be taught in the classroom, um, whether diversity, equity, inclusion programs are allowed, um, what, what the incidence levels are of racism or sexism or ableism or homophobia um, and similar issues, right? Cost of housing. And so all these different things can apply to different locations. And so one thing that's worth always considering is like the different grains that matter. And it's like, and the grain above can affect the grain below, right? So if Albany loves ferrets, but New York state says no ferrets, it doesn't matter what Albany thinks, right? If your professor loves ferrets, but the college has no pets, tough, right? And so it's worth considering which of these matter to you and then looking at the details of location and seeing, you know, what's available at that location now and how it might change in the future, right? So you can read news articles and see how those things might matter. Um, do you have anything on that? No. Okay. Um, other things to think about for programs, right? So how long does it take the students to graduate on average, right? So are you going to be staying there for five years or for eight years, right? That's a big difference. What percentage graduate, All right? So not everyone will finish grad school. So people will decide, okay, I actually want to go to med school and they leave. So that means they're driven out, right? And so you want to get a sense of that. What careers do students pursue, right? Um, and is that, uh, is those careers, are those careers supported, right? So if you really want to go work at an NGO, and your professor is like, nope, I only care about students who go into academia, that's a problem. Right. Um, if you want to go to academia, then a program that emphasizes that could be useful. And so think about what your, your priorities are, what the program and advisor priorities are. Um, what resources are there for being safe in the lab and field? And that can be like how not to get bitten by a rattlesnake, but also be how not to be harassed in the field. Right. And so you have to think about those aspects of safety. How do students fund their research? So your tuition is funded, your stipend is funded, great. But how do you buy pipettes? How do you buy hip waders? Right? Um, how do you buy a compute time on the cluster? And so, thing is, how is that done to you can succeed? Um, how does student funding work? So, some programs they admit you and you'll be on a TA or main RA, but then the, your advisor has to find funding for you after year two or something. Right? And so, make sure if that's the case, they have a grant coming in or there's a, they have a good track record of getting grants. And then, what do current and past students think of the program? Right, that's a huge thing. I mean, how hard do you get to say, hey, future me, what do you think? Right? This is a pretty good analog to that, right? Where you can say, hey, person who's been here for two years, what's the program like? Um, so it can be worth getting that information. Yeah, Zingli? Yeah. So, you know, I think all the things covered here are very, very complete and comprehensive, right? And you, you can get a lot of this information by just talking to the right, right people. So start communicating because a lot of, you know, if you're applying to programs, most, if not all programs, research programs would want you to contact your advisor, the prospective advisor and say, hey, you know, I'm interested in this. Would you suggest that, you know, let's come up with a plan and uh, would, would you recommend that I apply? And often if the professor is willing to like consider your application, they'll say, yeah, please go ahead and apply. And that, that'll be a good indication. So once that is confirmed, you can start talking with, you can ask your advisor and ask your prospective advisor and say, and ask if oh are there people that in your lab or has or 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 other people that have recently graduated that I can apply to and most most professors will actually give you contact information that encourage you to kind of talk to them so that's that's a really good indication that there's transparency and they are willing for you to talk with you know their students 
and from their students and their PACs postdocs, current students, current postdocs, you can very easily ask some, you know, all these questions. It's a really good checklist, you know, like thinking about, I, I like for, for me, I feel like funding is really important because you want to be in a place where, you know, you have stability in knowing that you're going to get paid or at least your tuition is going to be covered. You can get a stipend and that's really important. Healthcare is really important as well, you know, um, and the research funding, because different people do different types of work. Some people might do computing work and some people might be like, oh, I really need to go to the field for three years, right? So how is that field component funded? Talk to the professor, talk and ask, do I have to find my own funding? Most, some professors will say, well, I expect you to apply to grants, but I can help with this amount, you know? So something like that, like more, get more specifics would be really useful. So timelines. So August to November, um, identify and reach out to potential advisors. So it's getting late, it's still time. So reach out to people who might be good. Um, and again, people might be in the field or whatever. So they might ghost you, try again. Um, and then it's past now, but for future years, the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship is amazing, right? So it gives you three years of funding without a requirement to do an RA or a TA, right? So it gives you more flexibility. And it's based on just five pages of writing, right? And letters of rec and transcripts and stuff like that. And so you can apply once at undergrad, once as a grad student. Um, that can be a nice thing to get. So do consider that. Also, those of you who are applying next year to grad school, right? Showing to your potential advisor, like, hey, I applied for, for an NSF GRFP, suggests that you know how to go out and try to get money, which helps in a lot of areas of science. Um, November to December, check deadlines apply to grad school. Um, different programs in the same institution might have different deadlines. I applied two weeks late to my program I actually ended up going into and they managed to get me in anyway, but I, that was very bad, don't do that. So watch the deadlines, apply early. Um, there may be fees to apply. There may also be fee waivers. And so good programs won't hold against you. You know, you don't have $50 to apply to each of these programs, that's fine. Um, but just you reach out for fee waivers, but note the, the fees. Um, oftentimes programs, especially well-funded ones, will have visit day or visit weekend where they'll fly, you know, people who made the first cut of applications out to see the program. And so you'll interview, um, you'll see, you'll see the, the campus, you'll see the lab, you'll get to talk to people. Um, and this is a really good way for you to see how the program's culture works, right? Would you be comfortable there? You know, if, if everyone was about to drink beer and you don't drink beer, right? That's a problem. You don't want something that's accessible. Um, does it feel safe for you there? That sort of thing. Um, Zingli has stuff to add about visit day. Yeah. So the visit weekends, like to, not all institutions have them. Like uh, we, like I know that. So at the University of Tennessee, we we do have them. And for this year, you'll be um on the third weekend of January. So that's the kind of the rough timeline. Some programs will invite you out kind of late January to early February to talk with a prospective advisor, meet with labs, meet with the department and things like that. Um, and so at UT, um, our deadline for application is December 1st. So applications have to be in by December 1st and all the letters and statements have to be in by December 1st. Um, for UT, our program requires two letters. One is like a list of professional goals. And um, so a statement of professional goals and one more statement for research experience and research goals. So most programs would have, you know, at least one statement or two statements that you have to write. So, but, you know, in working with the grad admissions committee, you know, we talk with different faculty members and different faculty members actually, you know, they look for different things in the research, le le uh, the research statements. So as you apply, feel free to talk to your prospective advisor about crafting those statements and, you know, ask them for input, like give them a first draft and kind of early on, don't give it to them the night before the application is due. But think of it as a continuously, you know, work, uh, uh, like a continuously evolving statement where you're, you're, you're getting input from your peers, from your prospective advisors on how to improve those statements. And usually, you know, as um, as a member of the graduate uh, of as 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 a member of the graduate admissions committee here. Things that we look for in a research statement typically includes like, you know, 
have you done research or have you had academic preparation that in, in a field that's relevant to what you plan to do? So first you have to really think about what you plan to do. You know, some people might have more concrete plans, more detailed plans. And personally, I would, you know, recommend that you go to the level of detail um, as much as possible, but only if you're comfortable with the detail. So, so for instance, if you go and you talk with your prospective advisor about a project, if you can get specifics and think about, oh, this is the plan that I have, I'm going to work in this field site, I'm going to ask these research questions, I'm going to use these methods to actually uh, answer the question. If you have that level of detail, then you know, feel free to put that in because more is better, more, more detail is better if you have the detail. But if you are applying to a program where things are more open and you have more open research questions, then you can specifically you know, name some examples of questions and name examples of approaches that you can take. Um, but typically what we want to see in those statements is that, uh, that applicants have the ability to reason um, to come up with questions that are interesting and questions that can hopefully move the field of ecology and evolutionary biology forward. So, you know, have some background research on the literature, what's known about the system, what's known about the questions that you want to answer, and then what your proposed research with your advisor can actually bring that forward. I think the best statements that, that we have read are typically like that, you know, they give a good context to why they want to do the research and then they propose a research program that is really interesting and innovative. Yeah. And don't be afraid to apply. So like one thing good programs recognize now is that not everyone has the same access to research, right? So if you go to a school that has lots of, lots of paid research opportunities, it's different than a school that doesn't have as many, right? Or some students might need to get a well-paying job in the summer where others can sort of volunteer at a lab. And so people know that this is a thing, but as I was saying, the more you can, the more evidence you can show that you're ready to start research, the better, right? And so, you know, showing you understand, you know, what the resource research done in the lab can help and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, some schools require you to write like professional goals or have some kind of uh, personal statement kind of thing. It's also worth, you know, as, as what Brian was saying, a lot of schools, if not, all schools these days, they do holistic review, where it's not just what you have on paper, how many publications you have, right? It's not just the school that you went to for undergrad, if it's like a top ranked school or not. They are looking at different things. So if you have difficulties or challenges that you have successfully overcome in your life, you know, that can help you, you know, reach the, you know, where you are right now, feel free to include it in the letter as well, you know, because that speaks to your resilience. It speaks to your personal qualities that all admissions committee would like to see when evaluating the applications. Okay, so you visited, you got approved. Um, you should hear between January and April, some places it goes to at least late as August, but hopefully you'll hear well before then, um, an offer, rejection, or a wait list. And sometimes the wait list is just silence until you hear something. It might not actually tell you you're wait listed. Um, also, rejection can also be silence. So you don't know which it is. Um, and the offer letter should have details of support, right? So what will funding be? Is it guaranteed, right? Or does it depend on your advisor getting a grant? Um, what conditions there are for it, right? So if you're funded on a teaching assistantship, well, if you don't show up to teach, you should get fired, right? So there should be some sort of conditions for under, under which it should apply. Um, if, if you know, so April 15th is the typical deadline for acceptance, right? So sometimes we'll try to do like high pressure tactics, like let us know by February whether you were to come in, like that's not a good sign, right? Most grad schools have signed this agreement where they won't require any decision about accepting based on funding until April 15th. So we have time to get all the offers in and then compare them, right? Where would I be happy? Where will I have the most chance of succeeding? Um, you know, my spouse, partner, children will be happy at this place versus that place. So think about those factors as so we should have time. Um, sometimes when schools do pressure you to decide earlier, they don't know about this, agree this agreement. And so you can have someone, I, in the past, like, for example, I reached out to someone at a different school and said, hey, you're asking one of our students to decide early. Most schools don't do that. Do you want to change the deadline for them? And so they change the deadline for the program, right? So they might not know about this agreement, but it's, it's a good thing. Um, 
That said, if you know that you, you got in, you got an off, offer from three schools and you're waiting to hear from a fourth and you don't want to go to two of those schools, tell them right away, right? Reject them. So that way they can go and take their offers to the next people in line, right? So be nice to other people in the, in the pool. Um, but yeah, anything to add about this? Um, no, not really. So, uh, but I would like to add that, you know, often when, let's, let's say you apply to Professor A and, you know, after you went for interviews and everything went well and you're just waiting to hear back. Um, and, you know, a week later, the, like Professor A comes back and say, hey, you know, you have been, uh, you have been accepted, we'll send you a letter um, and, and stuff like that. Um, and maybe you're still deciding and two or three weeks later, the professor might come back again and ask, you know, hey, you know, just wondering what's, what's happening. Make sure you stay in constant contact, right? Like even if Professor A is not your first choice, be, be in constant contact and just say that, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm working out some plans, you know, I'll get back to you. Um, but often this professor would not ask you to decide within a week because I think that's not, that's, you know, because of the deadline, like professors or programs wouldn't be able to ask because if they sign on to the agreement, they would not be able to pressurize you in making a decision early. But they may obviously, you know, keep writing to you and asking you to make a decision quickly. Um, but if they are specifying a date and say, hey, if you don't get back to me by the end of February, we're going to pull that funding. I think that's kind of that's that's a red flag. So that you have to write to the department or write to the professor and saying that, hey, you know, I, I see that you are, your institution has signed on to this agreement and, you know, I would like to make my choice by April 15th if, if that's okay. So things like that. Uh, if there's a hard date, then it's, it's no. But, you know, be prepared that professors who really want you to, to be in the lab, they are, they're going to ask you again and again and, you know, trying to lead you to a decision that hopefully would, would be favorable to them. But if they're too pushy, I mean that's also a signal, like eh. <laughs> yeah, true. And and you know, and then on the other end, like conversely, if you're really interested in another professor, let's say Professor B, and you don't hear back from them, it's actually okay for you to you know send an email. You know, after a visit weekend, it's always good practice to send an email to the to to to, to your advisor. Some people might even send an email to the other faculty members or students that they interview with and say, you know, I really had a good weekend. Thanks for having me and and talking to me and stuff like that. So to Professor B, if you're still waiting for a decision, could just write to this person and say, "Hey, you know, um, you know, I really enjoyed my 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 interview weekend. You know, please please let me know if there's anything I need to do, and feel free to follow up. You know." Yeah. So a couple a couple questions in the chat. So, uh, should you give the give them a the statement of a month ahead of the deadline? Like for getting faculty feedback from the faculty, I think that's pretty good. Um, for the admissions committee. They probably won't even look at it till after the deadline. I mean, they like to know that, like, okay, people are, are people applying great, but they're not going to start reading through them until the deadline. Um, but getting feedback from your from your potential advisor, sure, that's good. Um, don't wait until the very last last minute to apply um, because sometimes systems go down. So when I first applied to the GRFP, it rejected my last name because the apostrophe, and like hey, we fixed that. But like, there could be weird things where the computer system goes down or it doesn't like some character in your name or something like that. And so give it a couple days ahead of time. And then keep in touch after the application. Yes, like you know, it's not weekly check-ins maybe, but just like continue to show interest, right? Yeah. Yeah. If 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 you don't hear back like by late February, I would say definitely if if the, that school is your first choice, professor, your first choice, reach out to them. You know, be, be, before it turns much, because I think most a lot of schools would reach that decision on who to admit, maybe mid-February, and letters will go out around that time, mid to late February. So if you don't hear anything by March 1st, you know, reach out and, you know, just be in constant contact. Yeah. And it, occasionally there are still offers that come in really late. So, <clears throat> and Pastor's actually made an offer in like late July, because like someone graduated, we didn't think we graduate on that time, and so we had extra TA line. And so like, okay, if anyone's still available in the pool who's, who would do well here, we can invite them in. Um, but I would not bet on that, right? So you come to April 15th and you have one okay offer and then like nothing else, then decide if you'd be happy there or if you want to wait another year, but don't like hope that you'll hear back later from someone else. Yeah, and that's also uh, 
reason why sometimes a lot of you guys won't get rejection letters. Like when I was applying for grad school, I applied to three schools, uh, got admitted to two, and the third one never gave me a rejection letter. And I think part of the reason why is because they are kind of keeping you on the wait list. And for reasons that Brian mentioned, if funding suddenly opens up, you know, like a new TA line, new RA line, and it happens in June or July, if they rejected you in April 5th, by April 15th, it will be weird for them to come back and say, hey, you know, we'd like to have you. And part of it is, you know, the system as well, because once they click reject, you're out of the system, so they can't have you back in. So, you know, the only way to really know is to ask your, your, ask your prospective advisor, you know, after March, if you still don't hear back, maybe they can tell you a reason. Maybe they will say, hey, you know, the department has limited funding, you're on the wait list, we're waiting, you know, things like that. So um, I think typically um, departments and faculty members are very transparent and they'll tell you. Yeah. So application requirements, so there's transcripts, uh, so your grades, letters of recommendation, which um, try to find people who know you well, right, and who work in science. Sometimes we see is like the different cultures of writing letters, right, where if you're working for a government agency, they might write you an honest letter, or academia might write you a very positive letter no matter what. And people on admissions notice this sort of thing, but there is definitely a thing. You don't want to ask someone who like, you were student 305 in their large intro bio class because they don't know who you are, right? They might say just, you know, so-and-so was in my class and got a great grade of A minus and turned in the homework on time. That's not a good letter. Um, yeah. And as Zigni is talking about, research statement, personal statement. Um, and some places have diversity statements, which is what you plan to do to help the university's goal of, of advancing diversity, right? Equity and inclusion. So it's not what you believe, but what you will do and what you've done in the past. Um, same thing with research, right? What you've done on research, what you plan to do in the research. Um, some programs still require the GRE, fewer and fewer do. Um, so the GRE is a standardized test in grad school and it tests high school math and writing and um, I think interpreting language. Um, not, not translating, but just like reading passages and giving feedback and stuff. Um, it's expensive and it's intended to predict first year grades in grad school, which in EB is not typically a huge deal. There might be like a class you take, like intro to ecology, intro to evolution. Like we have a core class here that covers that and you want students to do well on that. But grad school is mostly about the research you're doing and learning how to do research. Um, so most programs have gotten rid of the GRE, but there might be still, still be a few that do, do require it. Yeah, uh, make sure that the rec letters, your rec letter, your rec letter, letter writers know exactly when the deadline is. Because sometimes we get applications where, oh, it's due on December 1st, as per you, like you in our UTK example, but letters aren't in. And then we've got to reach out to the letter writers or reach out to the student and say, hey, you know, your letters aren't in. And it delays the process. And if the department needs to make a decision on who to invite for interviews, say by the end of December, so that you can you guys can get your flights in or your visit arrangements made, you know, we'll need to have the full information. So really reaching out to your um, letter writers early, giving them at least two weeks advance, you know, if not three weeks or four weeks even, and tell them, hey, I'm applying to all these schools. Um, you know, can you please help me write a letter by this date? You know, make sure you reach out to them early and not 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 leave it to the last minute. And one of the things people are doing is like not applying to schools because they don't want to burden their letter writers. But honestly, once they've written one letter, doing a second letter is very very easy, right? Um, they 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 might tune it more or less depending on how well they know the program and how many. But like, don't not apply to a school because you don't want to burden your letter writers. Apply to the schools you're interested in, and they will you know tweak it a little bit or a lot, but they can they can handle it typically. But just be very clear, like letter goes here, this date, this here's a URL, this minute, so forth. The easier you can make it for them, the better. Um, international students. So you'll need a visa to study in the US. The US decides whether or not to give their visa. And so they can deny it for various reasons. Um, and there are cases of students who like want to go to a place and the US just would not give them a visa to study there. And that's something to consider and think about. Um, there's limits on funding, so you can't get a GRFP if you're an international student. Um, limits on outside paid work, right? So if you're you come here to work as a you know G GRA or GTA, right? 
but some people also will get a side job doing something else. And programs differ on whether they formally allow it or not. Though I'm not sure if it's legal to disallow it. Um, but for general students, you can't. You're not authorized to work other than your program. Um, you might be tasked for showing English proficiency, depending on whether your institution thinks that your, your home country speaks English. Um, and it might, and they might not count it, or they might not, and they may, may count it. Um, also, while you're in the US, things like going on strike or being arrested could have different effects, right? Where if you're in some jurisdictions, if you're arrested, you can't be held for immigration enforcement over the weekend, right? Whereas there's, there's places you won't. So just other things to think about as an international student. Um, what else, Zingli? Yeah, so I was an international student. I came from Singapore. So, um, you know, I think what Brian has, has mentioned made, made a lot of sense when I was deciding whether to come to the U.S. for, a, you know, for graduate school. A lot of things were about funding, was about could I survive here with the cost of living and things like that. And um, was I in a university com like community where I can feel safe and where I can, you know, make friends and things like that. So those are the things that you want to, you want to kind of think about. And, you know, as I've always been saying throughout this seminar, talk with people in the department. If you're an international student, you might want to ask the your advisor if they could, you know, connect you with other international students in the department so that you can ask for their experience. Because depending on, you know, um, the different locations of the institution, uh, there will be different sorts of experiences for international students. So make sure you have all this information uh, before you decide. And as an international student, I've always gotten the information I need by asking different people. And as, as I was mentioning, you know, I, I think like typically like professors and faculty members are all very transparent. They, they, they're going to tell you what they think very honestly. So I'll, I'll make sure that I get the information by asking. Another thing to think about when you're choosing between programs is like power dynamics and getting help, right? So here's a, you don't have to read all the details of this, right? But here's a workflow chart that our grad organization did. Um, and they had stuff like, you know, do you feel comfortable asking your advisor? And for a lot of questions, yes, but not all questions are going to be yes for that. And your program should should know that and handle it, right? Um, because, you know, you, don't, you want to have ways of breaking the power structure because you can get the help you need, right? So for example, you go to Title IX. And so in the US, that refers to a law about gender equity. Um, and in this context, it's about you know, the sexual harassment or assault or things of that nature. It's a place that is charged with investigating it on college campuses, right? And so does, that, does your office work well at that institution? Um, there's other things like some, some places have an ombuds office, right? We have someone who can give you confidential advice and say, oh, yeah, go talk to a lawyer like right now. Or, oh, go over here to where the food pantry is or something like that. And so there's different, you know, and it decisions have to have different ways of doing this, but just like having, you know, being aware of how power dynamics work in academia and how to get help is a really important thing. All right. So discussion and questions. What, 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 what haven't we covered? What's unclear? What do you want to know more about? Um, just type it in the chat. And also remember the website, applying to eb.info, have more information, we'll have this talk, we'll have the slides, um, and stuff you want to see on that too, let, let, let us know. No questions? Seven. The question is, what's the number of grad schools to apply to in EB? Um, it's weird because so much of it is like whether whether there's a faculty member who wants you there, right? So among the set of you know people who faculty do want, I think our admission rate is maybe 15%, maybe 25%. What do you think, Singley? Hmm. I think typically. From previous years, we would get about 80 to 100 applications mm -hmm. cycle. We typically admit no more than 10. So 10, I think 8 to 10 is the average. So I would say 10, 10%, yeah. 10 to 15%. Um, so yeah, I think from what I heard from the grapevine, I mean, it's not, you know, it's, there's, there's no science to it. But typically, I know of people applying anything from 
two programs, three programs, all the way up to 10 programs. I don't know what's the interquota range or what's the median or whatever, but I would say ballpark figure, I think a lot of people apply to four or five or six. You know, most importantly, I think for EEB is that you know your the topic you want to work on. You know, kind of know the questions or the rough questions you want to work on. Apply to advisors that are able to help you answer those questions, guide you. So, you know, by doing that, you're already narrowing your number that you should be looking at to like no more than four or five. I think that's that's the roughly the, the, the number of people you should be looking at. And um, so, yeah, I, and like by talking to them, you know, having check-ins with them before applying, you can kind of know roughly, you know, how good is the fit and what is your comfort level working with the prospective advisor. And I, I feel like that would help you make your choice of whether you ultimately want to apply or not. But yeah, I mean, when you accept a offer, you know, always be thinking about, you know, would you be comfortable working in this place at this institution with this person, with uh, this group of students or colleagues or coworkers for the next three to five years, depending on whether you're doing a master's or PhD or three to six years. And, you know, ask yourself the question and if you think, yes, I'm super excited, I'm super comfortable, I love the question, then definitely accept. Yeah. Right. So um, th there are some other questions. So I'll I'll go next. Um, there is uh briefly explain the application process for coursework masters, different from research masters. So not every school has a coursework masters. Um I, I I would say uh some schools have them, some schools don't. Um there are schools in Europe like Cambridge or Oxford, they've got a coursework masters for, for conservation, for instance. Um US schools only some schools have a uh, course with masters. And then for US schools too, some PhD, a, a lot of EEB programs only have a PhD program. They don't have master's program. So I would advise you to go to the website, the respective website and look at the different paths that they have and then reach out to the coordinators, the graduate coordinators of those schools because it's, it's very different. The coursework master's is less of an apprenticeship model. So it might be more like applying to undergrad than it is to applying like a PhD program. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. So the coursework masters typically do not require you to contact the, the prospective advisor, whereas for a research masters or PhD, you would probably have to get, you almost definitely have to get some kind of contact with the professor, you know, so that they know your applications in there, right? And they expect it and they can effectively advocate for you if they know what kind of questions you want and if they are sure that they want to work with you. Because a lot of funding, yes, it depends on whether the professor wants to work with you or not for research masters or research PhD. So is it acceptable to apply to multiple supervisors at one institution? That'll vary. So partly it's software driven. So like at UTK, you can't apply to both our program, our department and different department. The software won't let you, I think. Maybe they fixed that. So it might not be allowed within a program. Um, it can vary. Some programs make you choose one primary advisor. Some do co-advising. Um, some it's, I want A or B, but not A and B. Um, so all possibilities are out there. Yeah, I love this question because it's, 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 a, it's a legitimate question. And I've, I've had, you know, we have seen applications where students would be like, oh, I'm happy to work with this person or this person. While it might seem like a, like a attractive option to kind of like cast your net far and wide, um, what some committees might think or some committee members might think, not just UTK, but other places, just thinking about the possibilities is that they may think that this applicant is more, is not focused enough in thinking about what they want to work on. Um, so that's one potential downside. The, um, there are also different downsides because it's always difficult. It's, it's a fraud issue because if you apply to different advisors at one institution, it's important to actually tell them, that's my personal opinion, to tell them that, hey, I'm actually talking with this other person and have an open conversation. Um, problems arise when you talk to both Professor A and B at the same institutions. You talk to them separately, never disclosing that you are 
considering them. Then in your application, when you write and the application committee sees it and they forward the application to the, you know, both A and B professors and they see that, hey, you're in, I never knew you're interested in working on this topic, you know, with this other person. So that might be counted against like, like yeah, because you never disclose it. And then Professor A might may think, hey, you know, why, why, why is this person not really thinking about uh, like telling me or I, I've no idea that you are interested in another topic. And they may think that you might not be focused enough. And, you know, so th there are issues related to that. E e even if procedurally you could write that you're interested in both advices. So as with my advice to everything, be open, be transparent. And if you're interested in two people, you know, feel free to definitely email. You can email two or three and say, can I, you know, talk with you? And then in, you know, by your second conversation, if you decide to continue the conversation with say professors A and B, you know, make sure that if you're comfortable, make sure that you tell them, hey, I'm actually interested in these topics that professor B and I'm actually, I talked to her once or I talked to them once. Uh, and I'm interested in your topic as well. Like, can you give me advice on how we can incorporate different topics and thesis? So be transparent and you can explore different projects. Some might be collaborative. Right. Yeah, and, and it could be like, if it was a collaborative, that could be interesting, right? Where like, I'm gonna work with Brian on new project methods for looking at sound, sound and also with you know Dr. Tanner on measuring sound and frogs in, in the wild and putting them together. Like that would be a strong application assuming that, you know, those two people actually can work well together, which often happens, but not always. So it's not a thing that's worth thinking yeah. about. And, and that's also important that you tell them upfront because if they feel like they're interested in the project, they, they are more than happy to facilitate that collaborative mentorship, right? But, you know, in some cases, it, 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 that may not be the case. Um, like this professor might not be interested in the kind of work that you're proposing to do. And if they don't know about it and you put it in the application, that might actually count against you. How specific should a research statement be? How long are they typically? So yeah. typically, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I thought you were waiting for me. Yeah, it's so like one, one to two pages. Um, as Lily said, like the more specificity you can have while still showing competence and showing flexibility, Right. So if I could, I could write a very specific one about, you know, studying tree height or something, but I don't know much about it. And so it'd be very specific, but probably be very wrong. Right. So you want to include just nothing, nothing to show that you know what you're talking about, but don't go further. Um, and, you know, tying it in with what that lab's working on is good. Right. Yeah. Other. Yeah. Like, I feel like typically for applications, like different websites, they would. Sometimes they may have a page length limit, typically two to three pages, de definitely no more than three pages. And, you know, put the your research, proposed research in the context of larger ecological theories. Like when you write an essay, you always start broad and then you go down and funnel down to more specifics. And, but as Brian says, like don't go more specific than what you have information for, right? So if you know that, hey, this is the project I'm going to do, you know, write about the project. Um, but if you don't actually know, also be transparent and say that, hey, this is something that I think can be done, you know. So it's, 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 it's possible to balance, have a balance between spe the specifics and also to be more general, just to show that you are aware of general ecological theory and questions that are important. Yeah, I've seen statements where it's like, I move things from tube to tube and, you know, like, but why were you moving things from tube to tube? Like, you know, talk about like, you know, the broader meaning of what you're doing and why and what you plan to do. Yeah. Um, are volunteer hours as important as research experience or is one sort of outweigh the other? So for us, like I've, I've seen like strong applications from like uh, volunteer hours focused on EB stuff. Like I've done, like, you know, someone did an outreach program on bringing people into science, right? Like you don't care how many hours, like was it 50 or 80? That's not like that. It's more just like, oh, you're effective in bringing people into science. That's great, right? Or like I create a program to take kids out in nature. That's cool. Um, but for most programs, unless the program where outreach is the goal, if you're applying to be an, like, you know, PhD that has a big outreach component, probably research weighs a lot more. 
Yeah. What do you think, Zingle? Yeah, I again, I totally agree with what Brian has said. It's it's all about whether it's relevant to what you want to do, and also what can it show your holistic development as a person, as a candidate. I, I I think if you leave it on your CV and just say, oh, I volunteered at this animal shelter, like, like I volunteered at Young Williams here in Knoxville, you know, but you don't say anything, you don't make any reference to that in your personal statement, then I think that's not helpful. Like that, that would be a super minor point. We, we won't know what context that volunteer hour is in. But you say that, you know, I volunteer at Young Williams, I do like, I volunteer at my undergrad institutions, Darwin Day, or I volunteer at my department's outreach to high school students. Then in your statement, I was like, I have a passion for teaching, I have a passion for communicating science, and that's what I've been doing. I'm concerned about um, like animal welfare, and therefore, I'm, you know, things like that. If you can put it in the context that's relevant to your research, I think that would be the most useful. So when you tour another campus or labs, what are some questions you should be asking when meeting new advisors or peers? I mean, are you happy here? Are you thriving here in your research and teaching? Um, are you getting what you need for your goals? What's that water stain? <laughs> Is that mold? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, what else do you think, Zingli? Yeah, yeah. I never knew mold was a thing because in Singapore it's so humid. There's mold everywhere, so it's like. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. um, yeah, what's like like to live there? Yeah, um, the question that I would ask is that you know what is one thing that you like most about this department, and then I would so that's a leading question. But the question that I really want to know is what is one thing you think you would like to improve in this department. So kind of like asking them, yeah, what do you like, right? And then they will say, yeah, I like all these things. And you ask them what you want to improve on. Like you don't ask them, hey, what do you hate about this department? Or what do you hate about this city? You ask them, what do you think can be improved? And I think that would make people be more willing to, because they're not criticizing, they're, they're suggesting improvements. Yeah. And and like, you know, the lab stuff, if you're meeting with lab, uh, like students in your prospective advisors lab, Ask them things like, you know, um, what is the mentoring style? How often do they meet? Do they give you good advice in your work? Um, have you had any issues or potential um, problems communicating? Things like that. Is, is the prospective advisor available? Like whenever you have a problem, do they get back to you quickly? Are they really busy? Um, things like that. Yeah, that's a good point. So people can like, they can hold together for visit day and like, look how friendly I am. But then like, when you're actually there in year two, they'll take six months to apply to an email about your paper, right? Like you don't want that to happen. Um, yeah, well, another thing I always worry about is like biases. Cause like when you're on visit day, you're evaluating them, but they're evaluating you. And so, you know, people have various biases about like mental health or about having children or whatever. And so that's something where you might ask a question after you get the offer a letter and say, hey, how about this? That way they they can't act on their biases against you. Um, but that's really up to you how you want to handle that. Yeah. There, yeah, there's no need to review any personal stuff about yourself, you know, if you don't want to. Like, you know, if you have a family or, you know, your 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 marital st status, those things are not important. And, you well, know. Well, they're, they're important to you. Yeah, they're, they're important to <laughs> you, but it's not, in, in the application process, the graduate committee, your advisor, they don't need to know that. Like, you don't, don't feel like there's a need to disclose personal information to them. Yeah. But it's but up to you, like, what, what you want to talk about. But then once you get the offer, you can say like, will my spouse be able to find a job here that they're happy with? That's yeah. really good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Academic statement is three pages, less than three, what less than a thousand words. What do you think? Use a smaller font. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's I think that's fine. You can include figures and stuff too. That's okay. That can sort of help you stand out. I yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I think that's a good idea. Like we you know, a lot of the statements that we see just statements, but it's a great idea to put a figure, like conceptual figure on like what, what you plan to work on or things like that. I think that's great. That's a great idea. 
but yeah, it's it's not just it's it's not really about the the numbers or the statistics. Like it's not not about the number of pages or the words. It's about what you put in there. Is it relevant to the program that you are going to apply for? Are the questions compatible with what the department does, and especially what your prospective advisor does? I think that's that's the most that's the most important. Thing. If you publish, worth it's worth highlighting that. If you have a paper you're you're getting ready to submit, if you can put it in a preprint server. Rather than just like, I have work and prep for science. If you get something where they can point to it and like see it, that's helpful. So think about doing preprints too. Yeah, great. Um, during interview weekend, what type of questions should we ask them? Yeah, and that's like, the conversational filler for, for scientists is not um, it's what questions do you have for me? And so they'll keep asking you this over and over and over again throughout the weekend. Um, yeah, so you can ask them. I mean, so hopefully you should know what the if it's your advisor, you should know what they're working on, and so you should ask detailed questions about like, so why did you do this or what next? Um, it was a rando. Talk, talk, talk to them about their research. Um, yeah. What else? Yeah. So I'm 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 sharing with you all, all my master tips. So the tip is always asking them as 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 why I was mentioning. You know, what do you like about the department or the city, and then what would you improve? I think that that question is really it helps. Like when I was asking that kind of questions, it really helped to get some perspectives, you know, more balanced perspective of what's good and what they think should be done better. So like, what what do you think can this department improve in in terms of graduate support or graduate student support, things like that. Those are the questions that might. So so I think Brenna was asking, you know, the second part of the question is like the kind of question that might influence the prospective advisor's decision. Is that what you're asking? So how do you ask questions that kind of leave an impression on the advisor and make them more likely to admit you? <laughs> um, I think it it really depends and it it depends based on the person that you're talking with, you know. Um, and I feel like a thoughtful discussion of um you know how the city is like, not and not limited to that. Like typically, I think the signs. Like ask questions about potentially about hey this research question that you all have been talking about for a month and that this research question that you have put in your application as one of the questions that you want to work on, ask them about the research. You know, say things like you know when you go to the interview weekend, you should be able to get an impression of oh I plan to do this research project. You know within this timeline, this time period, I plan to use these methods. And the questions you can ask is that perhaps something like, hey, um, I thought about the methods, but I'm wondering between method approach one and approach two, what do you think is the... So more science type questions that allow the advisor to see that you have considered the research and that you are thinking critically about the research that you plan to do. Like, I feel like that's, like for me, at least personally, I feel like if I get a candidate who is asking me scientific questions and also, you know, questions about my own research, hey, you know, and, but make sure that they're not trivial. Make sure that it's stuff that you really thought about, you know. And think about the mix of questions you ask, right? So like, if you like rock climbing, asking one question about like, hey, is there a good rock climbing around here? That's cool. If half your question is about rock climbing and not science, that'd be weird, right? And so, like, you're presenting like, you know, your priorities based on the questions you ask. And so, think about what you want to project with that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Yeah, I like I I I would say at least half of your discussion, if it's about science, it'd be good. Yeah. Um, what are some parts of the application that can make you stand out as a good candidate? I think having something where you have a paper in press or in preprint, so you can actually not just like you're not just a science enthusiast, but you're doing science of making new discoveries and being able to communicate that. That's good. Um, similarly, showing that you you know can have gone for funding, right? If you need funding for your research, um, showing you understand the context of what you're doing, right? So not just like I'm just you know I I spent the summer tagging dolphins. Why do you do that? Oh, to understand their their movements and how it was affected by global warming, right? It's like understand that context. Yeah. What what else? Stanley? Yeah. And so for this question, like different schools, different committees, different advisors might have different ideas of what makes you stand out as a good candidate. 
So we can only offer you our more generalized perspective as well as my own individual um, um, like perspectives. And I feel like, yeah, the relevancy, like how relevant you are in terms of what you plan to do and your and your scientific statements and the fit, the research fit, right? Between the questions that you want to pursue and your advisor, I think that's like like that's that's typically important. And if you have a thesis or like a master's thesis or chapters or undergraduate thesis or small projects or posters, you might want to include them, attach them as supplementary materials in your application, say. You know, in my undergrad, I actually did this research, never got published, but we have a poster or we have a presentation and include those slides or presentation, things like that. Um, and I feel like personally, I, I look at letters. So um, letters are important. Make sure that you get letter writers that could accentuate your strengths and your experience as a researcher. So you want to have at least, I feel like, one letter from your undergrad research advisor that can speak to your experience and your ability in doing research. And then, you know, one more general um, kind of academic type letter writer who with whom you have taken like upper level division up, um, classes. So you don't, as, as what Brian said in the previous slide, you don't want to ask your intro bio, like a level 100, like uh, a, a teacher to write something for you because then you know it'll be too general you'll be like oh this person was a good student got an a in my class but that was five years ago so like typically the more detailed the research let the more detailed the let break letters the better so the question of what are some resources things you can do if your research or chapters are not being completed on time um first of all like this happens a lot so you're not alone um I mean, some possibilities are changing a chapter. So you not you don't have a contract to work on certain things. Sometimes you can like switch a chapter and like we'll do a different thing or a way of reframing it. So sometimes like a negative result is actually a discovery, right? Where we thought this thing would be a factor and actually we now know it's it has a value of less than 0.1, right? That's still a discovery. Um, in bad situations, you can also, not only bad situations, you can also sometimes get a co-advisor or switch labs entirely. And some programs allow you to do that. Um, and then one possibility some will do is if you're in a PhD program, you can leave with a master's. And so you might, okay, I will try to get three chapters. It's now four years in, I only have one chapter done. Maybe I can leave with a master's and go somewhere else. Or maybe for my career goals, I only all I need is a master's at this point. Yeah, what else? Anyway? Yeah, I think that part, that's a, that's a cool question and that, that probably would need to be worked out between you and your advisor at that time, you know, reformulating questions, um, making like change it to a less ambitious question. But, it, you know, it, it really depends on career goals. Like, what do you want to get out of a PhD? What do you want to get out of the master's, right? Like, and I think for different career goals, the kind of chapters and the kind of questions who you work with might really differ based on what you plan to do long-term in, in, in your future career. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool, so check out the website, um, share it with your friends, we'll put this recording up. Um, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us. Thanks for joining. Yeah, just wanna end off by saying that, you know, good luck for your applications. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, questions specific to UTK, if you're interested to apply to UTK, please re reach out to myself or to Brian. And most important thing for all programs is that you want to reach out to prospective advisors early. Don't leave it till December and say, hey, I want to, do you think I can work with you next 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 year, right? It's 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 too short. So make sure that you re if you haven't started, start now, reach out to prospective advisor and ask them, and you know, ask for a meeting. If they are taking students, ask, ask to meet with them and talk to them. All right. Good. Thank you all. All right. Thank you. Bye.